Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full showtimes, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Floyd Ray. He's the senior writer and editor of Altuit. Floyd, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Kim, for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing is very innovative and cool. But maybe before we get into all that fun stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yes. Well, I grew up in Texas um, in uh, okay. between Fort Worth and Austin. I lived in both towns, but I moved to Missouri, which is where I currently reside. Okay. So I, I had a close-up look at Texas history as taught by Texas school. Sure. Uh, school. So I, I'd already been confused on the subject <laughs> from childhood. <laughs> sure. So what? walk me through, what did you take in university and why, and how did you get to Missouri? Oh, my goodness. It's so weird. Well, um, the last the last question first. I, we just My wife and I just moved up here uh, okay. in 2003, okay. but I have grandkids up there. Do I need to expand that subject? No. <laughs> sure, my, sure. Where were my grandkids? I was going to land on that on that part of the planet. Fair enough. Um, but um, I uh, went to Southwest Missouri State okay. uh, here in Springfield, and like other lost souls of the late 60s, um, I was interested in, oh, I didn't know if I wanted to be in theater or a writer. Uh, I had, you know, like everybody, I had delusions of the great American novel. Little did I know that the great American novel was in the process of, this is a this is an explosive statement. I don't say it to offend anybody, but I discovered that it was probably dying because the readership was dying for such things. Interesting. But um, I got I found myself on a collision course with technology, and okay. uh, there were a couple of auspicious sort of moments there. And so it in, it started out in, with Super Eight and Super Eight Productions, and ended up working in augmented reality many years later. Okay, so. Walk us through that journey a little bit, because how did you get into the augmented reality space? Because it's quite new-ish, it I is. guess. <laughs> it is. Yeah, way new. And I think I had great fortune with Michael and Chip. Um, I had worked with Chip before on okay. TV programs, and we had. I mean, we, we were kind of trench buddies. We'd been shot at by the same people shooting the same guns, so you know we got to know each other well. And over a course of 30 years or so, we'd worked on a lot of pretty much cutting edge um, projects. Okay. And uh, so Chip and I were, you, well, you go into these things and, and you really don't know where you're going. I, I love Stephen King's notion in on writing where he says, you go out every day, you're writing now, you go out every day and dust off a little more of the uh, fossil sure. and you discover a little more about it. That's the way you discover these things. And augmented reality simply um, hasn't been fully discovered yet. We just have a few bones. And so I guess that's how my, it, it was the a recommendation probably came as being someone who did a lot of writing and okay. was used to being thrown into this large murky vat of who knows where we're going. And uh, if I have any recommendation in life, it's the fact that, yep, I know, I know how to, I know how to survive that murky vat. <laughs> so I've, I've, uh, I think that's pretty much how I got the, you know, got a chance to do the writing. So you, you got to understand, we're talking about the the convergence of, it's we often talk about convergence of media crashing together, but what we actually have are rival language systems, and that's a deeper that's a deeper question to ask. I'm not, not sure that I'm licensed to even talk about it, but that's really what's going on here. How you take a really great subject and use rhetorical tools, electronic tools, to actually drive home the meaning and intention of, uh, of, a, of a narrative that's been authored. That's pretty heady stuff. And if you don't do a good job of it, you know, the, the audience gags and falls over. So <laughs> that AR, <laughs> you know, AR stuff is right in the very big center of that. And uh, uh, I've, the interesting thing is I have indeed, it's not as if I, I don't want to pretend to be Pollyanna here. I have been at this crossroads for a long, long time, 
uh, let me add one more word. I've been confused and standing <laughs> at this crossroads a long, long time. So it's not my first dance on the subject. And I think that's, I think that everyone who is uh, interested in becoming a writer for augmented reality, there are some really interesting things that I learned that I didn't know. And I've been, I've, I've written novels and screenplays and, and boy, did I ever learn a heck of a lot working on this uh, project, uh, the battle of the Alamo. It was just a, uh, Wow. Okay. Um, I'm dazzled by what I learned. <laughs> so 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 let's dive a little bit deeper into that. What makes okay. writing for augmented reality quite different and challenging and what exactly is this Alamo project you keep referring to? This is the one that we've won the award for. We've actually yeah. won several. Sure. And um the thing about it is the intention all the way through was to communicate valid uh, scholarship supported information about the Alamo because it's a, it's a political issue. It's, Oh my goodness. It's so many different things. And yet the, the general knowledge of what went on in Texas is not known okay. beyond what you know people have seen. So the question was, we cannot betray the subject with lousy scholarship. Well, that means you go back into the stacks like you did when you were in high school and college, sure. and you start researching and getting footnotes, but then you turn around and transfer. And the first thing you hear First thing you hear from everyone you're talking to, just as long as your segments don't last more than 30 seconds. I'm going to say, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, you, you, there's, there's no fabric. First of all, there's no existing narrative fabric in our culture today that even encompasses the Alamo. Of course, you know, no one knows what the Alamo is, I don't think, outside of Texas, perhaps. Sure. And so you've got to somehow create the framework, and then you have to create a salient sort of focused point, topical point that captures as much as you can pro possibly say in you know this 30 45 second space and then turn around and place that in a visual context and in the case of the alamo project it was if you can imagine this uh it's like being able to drone into a scene that's been foren forensically reconstructed in other words it's like whether, whether you're using your phone or your tablet or shortly your glasses you actually fly into the scene and you have the advantage of taking any perspective going in as close as you want. And the point is it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. What's the worth of this? Uh, what does it add? It's, there's a big, I know there's a big aha factor. I'm blown away every time I go into the album now and look at the book that's just been put out on it. And I'm, I'm just totally amazed at what I see going on, but I understand print resolution, information re resolution is incredibly high it's about as high as you get you know it's like a, right it's like super 70 millimeter film when it comes to conveying data but people most people can't read to that level of resolution so how do you how do you complement those educational details or that literary or narrative detail with a visual context that doesn't rob the light <laughs> from the eyes of the beholder sure and, uh, and uh, I, I discovered a big secret, uh, a huge big secret. I, I, we might talk about that at some if we have time. But sure. I discovered something really cool, uh, a new product, new market. And it's probably new to me and not – probably time, anytime you have a great idea, 15,000 people had that yesterday. So in other words, it may not be unique sure. with me. But the, doing this book, the, you know, the, the, there's been a book published. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's just been out for about three – two months now sure, and cool. uh, uh and i discovered something in the creation of that book that sort of satisfied all those original yearnings to be you know a writer with a velvet jacket a big dog and stone <laughs> fireplace and, you know you, you kitty am, am i communicating my my uh lunatic lunatic vision as a as a young man uh being a writer that's what it was all about i finally i finally came to a point point where i saw that Augmented reality represents a whole new venue for a lot of young people, and uh, they have a, an incredible opportunity ahead of them. I per that's my personal opinion. No, very cool. So let's step back for a second. For people that don't know the sig significance of the Alamo, what exactly is it? It's one of the core stories to uh, the American experience. Sure. And... Um, as uh, its setting comes, um, you know, what, 25 years or so after the American Revolution. Right. And yeah. after the revolution, people were spreading out in all directions. And the Mexican government at that time was undergoing a huge 
it, it's something that may even still vestiges may still be going on. Okay. But the uh, w- what happened in Mexico is you had the old line Spanish nobility set up, um, you know, what you would expect a colonial power to do. And the Mexicans rebelled. You okay. know, we don't want to be sending our money and treasure, you know, to Europe, to the Spaniards. So they got in a big squabble. And uh, the trouble is that they decided that they didn't want to spend the money uh, <laughs> defending the northern territory, which is known as Tejas. They didn't want to spend money putting troops up there because they were having financial issues that could better, you know, be served in central Mexico. So there were about 3,000 Mexican citizens in Texas. And they decided that all these Anglos wanted to go down to live in that wide open space. Let them protect the settlements against the Indians or banditos or whatever. You know, let them self-police. And that worked. (laughs) That worked until the Mexican government took a secret tour up and discovered that there were about 25,000, 30,000 Anglos, about 2,500 Mexican families, and 5,000 slaves brought with the Anglos. So suddenly when they woke up, <laughs> if they had if they had kicked the Spanish out of the New World, at least out of Mexico, there was a growing sensibility that the that the Texians, as that's T E X I A N S, were gonna throw them out of Texas. So there was a lot of hopscotching going on among the you know, the various political powers. And in the end the entire thing boiled down to a series of uh, two or three months. Uh, and led by this uh, attack of the Alamo, which is in San Antonio, and it was it's it's become legendary. Uh, uh, sure. Phil Collins, the uh, drummer, yep. is absolutely a uh, mad a uh, mad for the Alamo the Alamo story. I've understood that Ozzy Osbourne is as well. And okay. what they see as the heroics is known around the world, maybe not in the U.S., but it's known around the world as goes up there with Thermopylae and. All uh, you know, all the great legends of a small band holding out against a huge band, and in the end, they were totally slain. And that's that cuts to the chase. Sure. By the end of the battle, they had a siege that lasted twelve days, and on the thirteenth day, um, uh, on the thirteenth day, the Mexicans finally had had Mexican army. The soldados had had enough of this uh, holdout, and they charged the fort in the pre-dawn hours and. Uh, the the conflict may have lasted thirty to forty five minutes. It was short, but in that in that period of time, with cannon fire and rifle fire and people fighting and killing each other hand to hand up close, um, there were there were literally hundreds of people killed, sure. hundreds of people killed, and it was a horrible it was a horrible story. Um, I'm, I'm I'm still kind of having nightmares about the research. It, it's, war is not a pretty thing, and it should no. be avoided at all costs. Let there be no doubt about that. So anyway, at, at the end of that, the Mexicans basically, under General Santa Ana, who's kind of a villain in both, <laughs> he's a villain to both Americans and Mexicans. Okay, interesting. He, he's, he, was, he was kicked out of the country, I don't know how many times, he was voted in president 11 times. And as in the late 1860s, he was living in Staten Island, New York, if you can believe that. And uh, he uh, helped invent chewing gum, another thing I did not know. Interesting. Uh, this is uh, anyway. Santa Ana was just such a an amazing man. So, in other words, we're talking about a lot of granular info, and we try to include as much as the, of that as we could in the project. And obviously, when you're dealing with technology that is, um, you know, augmented reality technology is not a walk in the park. I mean, it's it'd be nice to think. I mean, I, if I could just, you know, if wishes were fishes, we'd all go to sea. Sure. You know, if 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 I could do a if I could do an augmented reality segment by myself, um, I would do it in a heartbeat because I can imagine what I can do. But quite honestly, when you're dealing with the laws of physics in the current state of, um, you know, technology today, it's not, it's really not, uh, not so straightforward. And that's where the challenge is. How do you take that granularity uh, of the information in a historical account, which is really interesting, a lot of bravery on both sides. Sure. I mean, the Mexican, the, the Mexican bravery and uh, they were fighting for their own national honor. Sure. And uh, I think Santa Ana betrayed them because he betrayed the honor. There were a number of Mexican generals that are absolutely infuriated when when Santa Ana pointed to the uh, Davy Crockett, who was there, uh, Jim Bowie, who died just before, probably just before the final rush, and the uh, 
five or six Texian survivors that had been in the church after all the others had been killed, he ordered these unarmed prisoners out into the uh, courtyard in front of the church, where he then ordered them killed, or at least uh, indicated that he wanted them butchered, and they were butchered right there. And that, that act of savagery brought tears to the eyes of these honorable old world Mexican generals. They were absolutely floored that he could be, do such a thing. And, um, and, and of course that's where, that's where in the, the next battle a month later at San Jacinto, uh, the, the Texans were so riled up that they, uh, and I can even make a point here. This is something most people don't know. There were, there were Tejanos, Mexican born Tejanos, uh, or Texas born Tejanos who were fighting on the side of Davy Crockett and all these, uh, you know, all these Texians, they were there and it, you know, they, they were not all, they weren't, they weren't all there, but there were quite a few significant ones, including the incredible one Seguin, who was a, who was an amazing man. And this story never gets told the role of the Mexican, the Mexican family in its own self-defense, but they had been fighting the, uh, the Mexican uh, army, the soldados, all the way back 10 years previously. So this was an extenuating circumstance from a, from trouble that was, you know, they'd been brewing a long time in central Texas. Well, I just gave you a, I just gave you a Texas book report. I'm so sorry. No, no, um, it's I, good. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm curious then, how does that translate into uh, yes. all- augmented reality experience. So what exactly yeah. did you translate into the actual project? Because I was checking it out. It's very cool and, and very innovative. Yeah. Uh, well, the project, um, the project grew. Okay. Um, in the begin in the beginning, the first thing that we wanted to do, and the first thing we did was we brought in a, an incredible forensic, uh, uh, I would call him uh, illustrator. Okay. A guy by the name of Gary Gary Zaboli. And he if anyone knows the exact <laughs> the exact footage in the Alamo, he knows he seems to know every single square foot. It's done from a lot of research from Platts from the period. And Gary and then of course Stephen Harden, uh, who was also a consultant on the project. These guys know Texas history right down to the you know, millimeter. Okay. And so the reconstruction of that fort was the the Alamo Fort was the main character. Okay. Um, and the ability to explore it. Now, here's the weird thing. Since no, none of us knew, we knew that you could say, we're going to build a fort, and we knew we could go in and VR, virtual reality, which is a totally immersive thing, and we had done that. It was kind of weird going into this going into this fort, uh, haunted, I might add, haunted fort. Uh, okay, Because when you're actually there up close, and that was our test bed. That's where we, I would say, that's where we first kind of, uh, Chip Walters, who was the innovative genius behind so much of the technology. Um, that's the first thing we did was we went there. Okay. And so what are we going to, how are we going to sell this? I mean, we, we need to sell it. We were fortunate because we found Lane Trailer and uh, with Experience Real History there in San Antonio. And Michael McGar was uh, so key in, in building up the vision of the project that it took that kind of effort to help us explore. Okay. And filmmaking, filmmaking is a lot like this. Sometimes you go up expecting to get something one day and you suddenly discover on this reel, you got something else. And you think about it and you go, golly, this unscripted event turns out to be more interesting than what I thought we were doing. I mean, originally we thought we were going to do Pokemon go goes to goes to alongside Davy Crockett. Okay. And you can get the vision. Can you imagine? You get the vision of you know, here you go, you go to you go to the Alamo and you walk around and Davy Crockett suddenly flops down inside you and says, Hi, my name is Davy Crockett. Best automaton voice sure. you can, you know, conjure. And uh, that's kind of the that's kind of what we thought we would be we were heading. But as we got into it we realized that that the styling was so much so much larger. What if you took this character this fort that is actually a character in the story and let it serve as the stage for all the events that happen. Okay. Uh, showing the North wall and the stuff that, and I got to tell you that most people who study or try to understand the Alamo, when you have a simultaneous branches of attack, yep. whether you're studying Normandy or whatever, it gets confusing. I mean, my head's like everybody else's head. I, you know, some, some whiz bang, you know, <laughs> scholar starts talking, 
50 ways from north. And, you know, I go, Nance, you know, let's watch something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Your eyes gloss <laughs> over and you're just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Totally. <laughs> so so what happened is we realized with this with this huge and beautiful reconstruction, it's probably the most accurate reconstruction ever done, we decided, well, let's begin to build some scenes. Okay. I think that was part of the that was part of the general design. Well, we started doing that, and the Woody Museum in San Antonio said, hey, we're coming up to the 300th anniversary of San Antonio. Is there any way you could combine this, somehow project hologram-like, and it's not a hologram, I want to specify that, but that we could somehow project this using iPads or you know Chromebooks or whatever, that we could actually project the reconstruction that you've done over our diorama. Interesting. Uh, a projection that would include uh, the various uh, Anglos and Mexican soldados shooting each other, running around in this little space that's, you know, what, 20 by 20, you know, that they keep in the foyer or whatever. The, so the guys basically dropped dropped our first effort, uh, didn't drop it, we suspended it while they went down and figured out a way to make a viewing room where you could see uh, a living example against it, a little more old-fashioned medium like a diorama. Okay. Are you, does that make sense? Yeah. I yep. live in Missouri, so I didn't get to see it, but it was it was evidently quite impressive. Well, so here's here's this is kind of a cell mitosis thing going on here. Sure. So here we were working toward the first effort, and suddenly we had a second contract that leveraged those core assets, right? Mm -hmm. And this included testimonial evidence. We were actually doing we were doing uh, audio work for characters that we were introducing into the show, you know, into the, into the program. Sure. Well, uh, we eventually, one of the guys came up with the idea of, well, let's just make, since there's not such a thing as an augmented reality platform for product. I mean, let's face it. How many augmented reality things have you seen for sale? Well, there's Pokemon go. Sure. And there are a few other things, but outside of that, do you see anything that's going toward education? You see anything that that's leveraging that in that direction? Yeah, interesting. And so um, we, the guys, came up with this incredible idea. Well, let's take what we're doing and let's let's create. It looks like a little uh, a little mouse pad, except it's pretty good size. It has a picture of the Alamo on it, a, a nice perspective on it, and it has targets in it. So when you get, if you buy that particular version of the product, which is a uh, it's, I think it's called Experience Real History. It's a, a diorama board. Anyway, you can see you can see the uh, the 3D versions that we've created pops up in front of you. Very cool. And you you can actually go into rooms that have been you can go into the room and walk around and look at the room under reconstruction with that thing. I mean, it's 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 the, that kit is just amazing, and it's been for sale for a while. That led to the creation of playing cards. You know these little right. yep. uh, Pokemon Go cards. So yeah, we got these little cards. They're real cool, and they even inter some of them even interact with each other. So you put two character cards together, and you know they shoot at each other or whatever they do. And and then in the end, they got this. They got so excited about what was emerging, uh, they decided to do the book. And I just had to write some other copy for that book, but pretty much. And so in other words, I think the, the point here is augmented reality is still being discovered. And in this case, it just, it just grew okay. and the products grew and we learned so many incredible things. And I learned probably the most significant thing of all. Um, and by the end of it, I thought, boy, this was an amazing blessing for me because I probably wouldn't have had a chance to be up close and, you know, personal with, with the technology to this degree. But I'm telling you these. So coming out of this thing were like four products, four or five products. Sure. And obviously leveraged around those assets, those core assets. So you ask how it emerged and why did it emerge the way it did? Well, the Alamo is in a context of products, and it was also the center uh, context for a telling of the story all the way from. I don't know, it's. I, I would say it's an. Ed, it's probably more of an educational tool right now than it is anything else, but. There, I gave you a longer answer, but I'll tell you what, I, I, was, I purpose not to talk forever <laughs> on this subject. No, no, it's good, man. So I, I'm curious, though, because you guys have done a bunch of other products or projects, sorry, in this space. I, I'm curious to get your thoughts, because you keep mentioning we're at the beginning of this stuff, but do you mm -hmm. have any 
predictions or, or projects or things that you would like to try with augmented reality or some of this other kind of cross platform, cross reality type stuff? Because I agree with you. I think we're at the beginning, but I'm, I'm curious just to get your thoughts and from somebody that's kind of in the trenches building this stuff. I was kind of hoping you wouldn't ask that question. All right. <laughs> Next question. No. Because no, 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 no. It's a, it's a real temptation to tell you. And yet, um, to be honest, I think I will, because I, um, honestly, we need other people working on this. Uh, media stuff is often closeted, you know, within organizations, institutions, and okay. it needs to be, it needs, it needs to be taken out and vented out in public because there's, there's probably some 16 year old kid He's sitting up in the top of his, uh, you know, you know, in the attic somewhere, you know, imagining things. And he needs to be encouraged. He may be the may have solutions that the rest of us haven't seen. But I will tell you what, what I, what I discovered. Okay, sure. And this is probably about the best thing I can tell you, the, the most I can tell you on this subject. After the book was done, I walked away because this had been, this is this. There's been a conundrum for me. How do you mix text? Yep. Written text with context, which is what a movie is. A movie presents, it's a context record. It's electronic. It may be filmic. It may be whatever, but it's a context record because it gives you, it gives you the sound of the voice. It gives you the, you know, the vision of someone running or a car driving or cow moving, whatever. Um, And so how do you join text and context? Sure. Does that make any sense? Yeah, very much so. Because every time, every, every time, every time you put a picture up, it takes intellectual light from the yeah. text. Sure, interesting. Got to got to understand how, how 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 profound that is to understand. Is there any way though? That you, why would you want context? Well, simply because an animated diagram, a scribe, for instance. Have you ever seen how much information you can actually present to a user in a scribe or something where you've animated relational values and you see you know this atom exploding and. You know, Walt Disney did this with a lot of the stuff in the 1950s that he would show in The Wonderful World with Disney. These these visualized context sort of essays are powerful because they invite the, the non-enlightened to speculate and understand things that would take them, <laughs> if they had to read it and get up to speed, that would take them forever. Sure. So how do you use the specification of text and... Add to it using context without one stealing from the other. And I found the answer to that. For me, at least, maybe I'll die with my answer and no one else will find it. But when I, when I, did, this, when I did this book, I looked at the page of text and I was writing, I was writing more intense, higher resolution content on the left page, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a coffee table book. Okay. And on the right side of the page, I was writing more of a film script. So there were two forms. There was a call for context record on the picture side, which is where the, the targets are. And on the left side of the page, where you have just the text, of course, just the text. Sure. So you had text and context here. Okay. I honestly think that the book publishing industry, if they're paying any attention at all, I mean, let's just face it. Uh, you, I don't know if you saw the reports of newspapers closing down, closing down last last week, but there was a yep. big national report of a number of other newspapers are going belly up. Yep. This is not, this is not due to laziness as much as it is practice. People do not practice reading. Period. It's, it's in other words, they yeah. can still read the uh, menu at McDonald's. I mean, show, sure. I defy you to show me someone who can't read the menu at McDonald's. But, sure, but. Um, but um, they don't. They don't read as a rule. They don't have this incredible tree of uh, organization that comes from someone who's read all their lives and they've you know, acquainted with general points in history and general points of science and general points of language. A lot of young people, in particular, and I'm, I'm really pointing myself to some of my much loved uh, relatives, my my kin. <laughs> sure, sure. And I look at. I, look, I feel sorry for them because they, for whatever it is. Um, they're they're cued in on a different level, and yet they're denied access to this amazing wealth of information just because uh, they don't read. And so, oh, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, the publishing industry kind of entered this great suckhole, and 
the the number of people who were reading books, what they were reading, novels or whatever, I don't know that it decreased greatly because they, they're still making lots of money. But there was something that choked up because textbooks could no longer serve their clients. And and this I suspect the same is held true for publishers at large. There's this incredible practice of publishing that's been going on for 300 years and more. Sure. And it involves um, obviously publishing and distribution. And um, that whole format has kind of gone into um, hibernation at this point. Sure. I mean, you know this, you've seen this yourself. And to someone like myself who's a writer, I grieve over this. I mean, it mm-hmm. makes me almost physically ill. Well, so I was, I was thinking about it, as I looked at this, I thought, you know what? So here in this book, the Alamo, you know, the battle of the Alamo, we have both. I, I, I will, I will be the first to admit that what we have here is, is probably not the highest sort of articulated uh, expression of the best use of augmented reality for this kind of scribing stuff, because this is a, this is like a real natural, I mean, when you look at it, you get a better sense of what's going on, and I think that's the recommendation. But I was sitting there thinking, what if you were to take uh, this approach with a historical subject? Like, uh, I started working with Amelia Earhart, just penciling in a sketch of how we do Amelia Earhart. Sure. And um, I I realized that I could, on you know, one side of the page, I could actually write a kind of leading uh, focus statement. On the other side of the page, I could use filmic technique to actually uh, drive home either what's being said on one side of the page or add new stuff to it. So it's like blending a movie and a book together under one cover. Now, when you think about how, how incredibly profound that is, you can take those targets and you can pretty much tack the edges. I think thumbtacks, you can tack them to the edge of that page. So when you flip that page open and you aim your camera or your smart tablet or your glasses at that picture page or the page where there are targets, it can explode in motion. Sure. So suddenly you have all the advantage of, of educational TV on the right side of the page and all of the incredible and important specification that goes with text on the left side of the page. So there we have done what had been for me kind of this elusive, this elusive goal of blending the two together. Cause I didn't know how you did it, but I think this is how you do it. Now think about all the presses that are currently idle in this country. What if you're able to wake back up that whole distribution channel with innovative product for students, for, you know, guys like me who like, <laughs> my wife and I love to watch English murder mysteries, you know, sure. on yep. Brit box or whatever. Can you imagine what kind of world that opens up to, to give you both working together, both uh, med- uh, alphabetic forms working together hand in hand? Uh, instead of com- competing, I mean that's pretty incredible, and I think that's what we're going to discover with augmented reality. Right now, we've got ideas of you know people walking into the store with augmented reality glasses, and the chipmunk jumps you know off the cereal shelf and runs around the floor and does something, and you tap it and you get some money or whatever. I don't know what they, I don't know what the insane ideas are. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly that's certainly rational. I understand what they have. I'm not discrediting that, but there's really a chance for. Uh, some amazing new approaches to the way we educate ourselves. And that's where augmented reality is going. Your ability to shape the real world, but also uh, deconstruct it uh, in this space and hold it up for examination. And in doing so, not rob all the light from the page of text. That's pretty. That's some pretty amazing thought. So now I'm giving you my best idea. You now know more than I know. On this subject. <laughs> no, it, it's interesting. I I agree with you. It, it, it's interesting because I, I think we are at the beginning of this stuff, and th- you're right. There's so many things that we can merge old technology with new technology. We can bring stuff into the physical world virtually we i think we can also help bring some of the physical world back into the digital world right and those oh, yeah. kind of ideas clashing back together I, I think is potentially one of the next big uh industries to kind of boom right and i think the the simplest mm-hmm. example that i can think of that i think a lot of people know and he- heard of is 
the Amazon Go stores, right? Where you mm-hmm. you scan mm-hmm. your phone yeah. to say you walk in. There's no cashier. Yep. You take stuff off the shelf. It automatically knows which items you've taken and who you are. Right. You walk out and it just automatically bills you. And I think yeah. that's a simplified version of merging the digital and the physical world together, right? And I think uh, if, yeah. if people go check out what you guys have done with the Alamo Real uh, Reality Project and a handful of your other projects, it's actually quite fascinating, right? Because I think in a lot of cases, there's so much stuff and we've just scratched the surface of the whole space. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, of, you know, I'm not going to tell you all them, but just, Think of me. I'm an old man. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm an old man. <laughs> and uh, it's fascinating because I'm to the point where I no longer have too much energy for, for a lot of battles. You know, okay. I've already fought so many battles. Sure. But I'm pretty sure that for the highest, best sort of discovery to be made, we're going to have to deal with the prickly issue of human language and how it works. Okay. What and do you what mean it by is that? What it is. Well, if you go back to Lascaux, the, the caves in France, I think that's how you say it, Lascaux, um, you see that you've got paintings way back where there's no light of, of cave creatures right. that were painted very meticulously. And that, I don't know if you've ever studied that. That's the most amazing thing in the world. But okay, there you have a sort of primitive notation. Okay. You know, I have no idea. Nobody knows what it means. If you go back to you go to 3000 BC, you see that uh, there's some proto Sumerian text going on where they're doing, you know, where they're making abstract symbols that represent sounds. And then you have the hieroglyphs and then you have cuneiform. Language has followed this trail and it's an, a beautiful trail. And it, the trouble is so long and it takes, you talk about granular. Oh my gosh. But, uh, all the way through, you get up to Greece and the, the classical period of Greek culture, and then you proceed to Roman. Uh, every time that you make some big either s- civilization change or whatever, you find the language, the lingua franca is what they call it. You okay. find it, it changing. And suddenly, if you, if you knew something in Greece or if you knew something in ancient Akkadian, uh, if it's important enough, it's going to get translated you know, into Greek. Okay. At some point, sure. And some point, it's going to be translated into Latin for the Roman world. Right. So you see this consecutive uh, curation of information, right? You pass it forward, and there's a there's a heart and soul within that language family or that language innovation that that actually gets conveyed forward. Now, all the way through, if you were, let's say that if you were in 1500s, and you are a Latin scholar, right? Okay. You're living in Europe. And suddenly people start writing for German and, you know, of course, then eventually English or whatever. You you get upset because you now have to learn English and you can't just stay with Greek and Latin. Although those remain the standards, you've got to expand because the the symbol, the symbology has changed and the rules of grammar have changed. So, so you see, language is this long thing going on. And the weirdest thing happened <laughs> around the 1820s or so. And that is... Um, Oh, the Frenchman, I can't remember his name, uh, began to shoot photographs. And okay. he shot one of the, you know, the, the farmyard behind him. I think it was 1820s or 30s. And bless his heart, he didn't realize it, but he was creating the beginning of a whole new language system. And here's the point. From that would proceed film, then video, and where we are today. Sure. And yet, while we were passing into this new language system of, we'll call it context records, Nobody understood it was actually a language form in its own right. Right. So it was not given the dignity of study. Interesting. It wasn't given the dignity of, um, what would you call it, grammar. Okay. Uh, and there are, there are a lot of people who studied film, for instance, as grammar, and it's all very interesting reading. It's not something you do want to do on a holiday or anything, but it's very interesting reading. <laughs> and by the time you get to the end, you realize that one of the great, things is that we have emerged in the minds of our young, particularly, they speak a whole nother language, at least emotionally. And it's based and rooted in this context technology, whether it's music that they're listening to or films they see, 
um, they're not spending a lot of time decoding text on a page. Right. Um, and the bad, bad news is that no one's provided dignity for this context record form, certainly not of the sort that you would see with with uh, the emergence of Greek or, or Latin as world languages of knowledge. And uh, I think that I think that's going to be that augmented reality could actually confront us with codifying a grammar that makes it even more usable to more people. And uh, I, it, the trouble is, it's not Kevin. It's not going to look like we expect. Uh, language transition to look it's going to look it's going to look very different so there's, there's some major we're going to have to have some real scholarship and people who have a uh, a strong sense of mission in order to proceed against that because uh, uh it's a it's a big it's a big challenge and i would love for my grandkids to to grow up in a world that was a little more attuned to the language that they basically traffic in daily i mean they're, they basically traffic in a blind room um and we're doing our best to, you know, kind of contribute to their, uh, you know, their their exposure to b- the big ideas of history. But you know, they don't have all that much space for it. God bless them. They're you know, they're, they're they're preoccupied with lots of other things that are going on. So I think I think that's my hope. And you know what? I don't want to. I would never get an argument on that. That's just my personal hope for for sure. what augmented reality is going to do. Very cool. So you guys submitted this Alamo project to the Media Excellence Awards. Why do you think mm-hmm. uh, supporting uh, industry awards is is important? Well, look at this conversation we just had. Do you have any idea how many hedgerows I would have to hop to take what I just said out into the world at large? Sure. The the incredible opportunity that the Media X Awards has given to me. And of course, not just me, I'm, I'm just a member of a team, Sure. but it has given us a chance to go way out beyond uh, the parameters of our space. Sure. I mean, Michael McGar is a the guy you're going to talk to tomorrow. He's a wonderful guy. He's full of some of the most, make him tell you good stories. He's got so many good stories. And All right. I look at, I look at guys like him and I go, you know, how do we, how do we get, how do we take the bigger picture and amplify it and, and pass it forward. And it's through this, the media X award that has allows you to uh, make a difference in a big way, because there, if you think about it, how else would you do this? Yeah. Where else would you find the, the, the opportunity? So I give, I give the media X award, big, big applause, big, big round of, of applause because um, it means that folks who are, digging in the trenches and believe me there's sometimes absolutely no motivation to stay in the trench yeah, fair so long, you know and the, the innovation that had to be brought forward for the, the Alamo project was simply stunning things had never been done before we had to write new code and do all sorts of things to make that sucker sing and um at the end of the day i'm if we hadn't had people like uh, experience you know experience real history um working with us they were i think they understood uh the challenge and without that kind of understanding this sort of stuff does not get done so you know it gives us visibility and golly thank you because it also gives us a chance to there may be someone who hears your show today and they get encouraged and they have they know something that neither of us know it'd be so cool to uh to to discover at some point that they went out and uh through their innovation and uh and heightened vision, they did something that really made a huge difference. So, you know, keep up the great work. So appreciate it. No, I 100% agree with you. I, I think that's the thing that people forget sometimes is seeing what other people are doing in your industry that's revolutionary, that not only do you get to potentially meet these people in person, you get to talk yeah. with them, they inspire you. Maybe you inspire them. Maybe you even work together at some point. But I think yes. at the end of the day, if you bring enough people doing innovative stuff together under one umbrella, the hope is that other innovation comes out of that in a handful of different ways. And that's how I see the whole Absolutely. thing. And it sounds like you would share that same uh, sentiment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, you you guys are doing heaven's work, in my view. Uh, so keep it up. 
<laughs> well, Floyd, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. But where can people get more information about the Alamo Project and uh, all the stuff you guys are doing? Um, you can go to um, altuit.com. That keeps you pretty much posted. Uh, there's a there's a lot of, and I mean it's it's nerdy stuff. Some of it's nerdy. It's <laughs> good. It's I, good. I, I got to be careful. My my friends my friends might be offended by by calling them nerds, but uh, go to altuit dot com. Um, the the principal there is Chip Walters. He's almost legendary, and he uh, he's unbelievably gifted as a designer and and uh, an innovator and. And get in ch- touch with him. Uh, you know, tell him that you're interested. Um, you know, I think you can get him through the website. Right, cool. But uh, you can keep a list of what we're doing, going, uh, doing there, and uh, um, I think it pretty much gives a summary of all the uh, the different roads and venues of research that's, that are going on that going on for us at the, at the moment. Very cool. And it's a l t u i t dot com. Correct. That's right. Perfect. That's right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Enjoyed it, too. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.